Entrepreneurs can get stuck in their head. If you dream of changing the world, but you're not sure where to start, the Ad Valued Entrepreneurs podcast will help you transform your life and business. This podcast is for entrepreneurs who want more freedom and fulfillment from their work so they can live the life that they desire. You deserve it, and it is possible. It's time for you to add value. This episode is brought to you by Perfect Publishing. Perfect Publishing is a different approach to publishing a book. Perfect Publishing is sharing a project of hope. We carefully chose heroes of hope who exemplify living a life they created through faith, hope, patience, and persistence. No matter what page you open to in this mini cube of hope, you will find a leader with a big heart. You see you are not alone. The authors may share similar challenges that only hope and action could resolve. Get your free ebook at getadoseofhope.com. Get a dose of hope.com. Well, I'm excited for today's guest, Camille Diaz. Camille is a coach, author, and podcaster who helps enterprising people streamline their business and find happiness and harmony in their lives. She's become a sounding board and a trusted source of tough love for those looking to calm the chaos and plan for the future. Her ongoing goal is to boost the confidence of others and help individuals reach their personal best. Camille Diaz and Robert talk about the challenges of business, partnerships, leases, and even lawsuits. And yet, she perseveres and chooses entrepreneurship, the value of learning from experience and growing something with an even bigger impact. Today, she talks about money and teaches about money. We both agree more people need to start talking about money. Camille, thank you so much for jumping on the show today. And I just can't wait to, to learn from you and, and share your wisdom with our audience. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Robert. I am glad to be here. This is going to be great. Yeah. So typically just let each guest, you know, share their own entrepreneurial journey. And uh, and we kind of use that as the stepping off point for for whatever expertise we can share. Sure. How much time you got? We got an hour. <laughs> an hour. OK, <laughs> I'll keep it under an hour. <laughs> now let me give you the let me give you the kind of short version of where I started and the twists and turns in between. I kind of tell people that it seems like my entrepreneurial journey is like the corn maze that was created by the drunken farmer, just got on that tractor and started mowing in whatever pattern and just went everywhere. Um, but it really has turned into a way for me to be exactly where I want to be and need to be right now at this time. And it's working out perfectly. So uh, yeah, started out, uh, grew up in California. Um, tried really hard not to be a teacher because there's lots of teachers in my family and i was like oh no no i'm a rebel i'm definitely not going to do that not going to follow everybody else's plan i'm gonna do something else yeah it turns out i wasn't that much of a rebel and i was a hundred percent a teacher <laughs> just could not escape it no matter what i did or how hard i tried so uh all the way from orientation staff at my college trying to help the new freshmen figure out their schedules to uh, the education department at two different zoos, uh, training docent volunteers, running summer camps, writing curriculum, stuff like that. Uh, worked in an after school program where I started as like site coordinator over one site and then ended up as assistant director over 10 sites, uh, writing curriculum, running programs, training all 80 of our staff, you know, kind of just doing the same thing, but on a bigger scale. Uh, we moved to Oklahoma um, when our kids were toddlers because housing prices in California, and we were not going to be able to make that work out comfortably. We could have made it work, but it would have been a, a battle all the time. Um, so we moved and, you know, got a, the nice house with the yard and all that good stuff. Walked the kids to elementary school every day type of deal. Stayed home with them for a while. Um, but I'm kind of a serial entrepreneur and I think I got a teeny bit bored. Just a little. <laughs> I was doing contract work with people I'd worked for before. Helping my husband with his business because he's an entrepreneur as well and runs his own thing. And so I was doing stuff here and there. Uh, but then ended up starting a ballroom studio with a couple of partners um, because that was my hobby. And it was just teaching again, but teaching my hobby instead of teaching things I went to school for. So I did that and it was amazing. I mean, we'd have, you know, 100 people for a party on a Saturday night, which in the world of ballroom is kind of unheard of in a, in a smaller town, a uh, smaller city. So we would do that. And then one partner left. 
a new partner came in, disaster meltdown. Oh. Chemistry didn't work. We couldn't agree on anything. Uh, and of course, ballroom's all about having a fabulous, glamorous experience. So that wasn't happening for anybody. So clients were leaving and instructors were bailing out. And I'm, you know, sitting at my desk at 10 o'clock at night crying, trying to figure out how we're going to make rent, you know, all this kind of stuff. I'm like, okay, don't think that's how I want to live forever. <laughs> so new plan. So we ended up closing um, and a couple of things happened at that time. Well, well, for one, when we closed, we broke the lease, we got sued, we went to court, like the whole, there was a bunch of debt from other stuff, construction loans, like just, it was, it was, it was pretty gnarly. Like I would not recommend that, <laughs> not a great experience. Um, super, a lot of learning for me, but let's not ever have to do that again. And uh, I'm sitting in my room, you know, eating all the snacks, wearing the sweatpants, watching TV in the dark, just trying to blend in with the carpet and hope that no one will ever notice me again. So that's how I felt at that time. I was like, oh, I'm just going to hide here. And my phone started ringing. People would call up and they would say, hey, so sorry that happened, but would you help me with my studio, my shoe store, my construction company, my real estate business, my vet clinic. And I was, I was like, oh, I think this is a thing and I should probably charge. <laughs> so it only took me four or five people you know, before, because I was in such a state that I didn't see all the gifts that they were seeing. And they saw how I ran things, how I organized stuff, how great of a time they had. You know, like they were experiencing this whole other side that I sort of forgot I was giving. So I started doing that. And I think at this point, that was like six or seven years ago now. Um, started in the in the coaching world, took a little detour slash add-on into financial services as I started to rebuild my financial life got super inspired to um, not screw it up again. <laughs> I was like, I am not screwing this up again. And so I actually watched a class that someone invited me to through networking and they're inviting me. And I was like, oh, I don't really want to go to your class, you know, because people invite you to stuff and you're like, yeah, do I have to? But I did. I did. I was nice. I was like, sure, I'll be nice. And I'll go. They were persistent, which was probably a good thing. Um, and I got really angry after I watched the class because it actually answered all the questions that the professional I had previously been working with was not answering. And I'm like, okay, what's up with this? How come people aren't telling me the whole story? So they said, after I went through the process, they said, you seem really fired up. Would you like to come to work with us? And I was like, I don't know anything about anything or if I could do this or not. I mean, I just came from this just like dumpster fire of a financial world, like how, what? And they said, we will train you. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm coachable. Let's do it. So I actually did that about five years ago now. Um, and today I have a team that I train and I teach that class that I originally watched and help people, mostly entrepreneurs, get their stuff on track and get all back together and, and figure out their future and make sure they have a contingency plan because that's really the biggest thing. You know, we think our business is going to sell for millions of dollars and we'll just live off that. But, you know, what if it doesn't? Uh, might be nice to have a backup. No one's ever mad if their bill, mis, business sells for a lot and they've got some money in the bank. Like no one's mad about having extra. <laughs> Lots of people are mad about not having enough. <laughs> so that piece um, was one thing that I did. And then the other piece that I did with the coaching is I have realized that that is my sweet spot. It's the teaching. It's the helping people. It's the seeing the light bulb moment. And it's the part that I love. So I typically work with entrepreneurs who love what they do and they're good at it, but they are super frustrated with like all the time they're losing. Um, goals aren't being accomplished on schedule, eating healthy, sleeping at night, exercise, you know, vacation, time with family, all that stuff just gets pushed to the side. And every time they make that little tick on the to-do list, like 
five more items get layered onto the bottom and it's just making them crazy. Uh, so I help them create custom systems and processes in order to streamline their business and regain their life, like actually be able to achieve the goals that they want and, and have a life at the same time. So I don't know if any of that's worth talking about further, but that's my story. <laughs> of course, there's tons of cool stuff in there. So <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a lot, huh? No, well, I mean, it, it, it's a journey, right? Each of us, it's each of us is on a journey, and some of the right. lessons, some of the lessons along the way are are expensive and insightful. But mm. <laughs> when we take expensive the time, and painful, willing... <laughs> you learn them real good. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. There's people that learn painful lessons and, and like to stay in the pain rather than move on, and so that is true. So you mentioned a move to Oklahoma and and yeah. sounds like part of that was by design for the sake of your kids, for the sake of cost of living. One of the big things that I love to encourage and, and help people is to design the life that they want, to know to know what they want for their life, design this and then build the business to support it. And so it sounds like a little bit of that is what's happened in, in your life. Um, and so I want to dig into that, that idea of sure. designing the life that you want and then and building a business to support it. Yeah. So that's, I love that you put it that way. Um, at that time, we were designing, can we have a house that has enough bathrooms to have, you know, kids and parents and not have to fight over the bathrooms and especially when they become teenagers, you know, that kind of thing, which is where they are now and it's all working good. Um, but you know, it, it was, it's, we said, what is it that we would love to have? We'd like to have a yard for them to play in. We want to have the play set outside and the fence around the yard. So you can just tell the little kids to go outside and then they go do that. And you don't have to, you know, watch them 24 seven kind of thing where you're worried about them running into the street or the yard's only five feet by five feet. So they can hop in a circle, which is probably what we would have ended up with in California. Um, so all that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> So we we did kind of design this piece. It's funny how we ended up here. Um, I actually had a friend who worked out here and uh, called me one day and said, that person that I can't get along with in my office is leaving. And I was like, oh, good for you. And we just kind of chit chatted for a little bit because it had been a struggle for a couple of years of them in the same office together. And when I hang up, I go tell my husband the story and he goes, well, can you do that job? And I was like, I don't know, I'll call back. <laughs> so that's kind of how we even ended up with Oklahoma being on our radar. Uh, and then we jumped online and we saw housing prices and we were like, wait, what? It's a what? <laughs> and I literally just called the realtor, told her we needed to roll in closing. That was back in the days when you could still do that kind of thing. She said, well, we need to clear this on the house. So if it'll appraise for this, that'll work. And I was like, great, problem solved. <laughs> Which is just like, can you even really do that? But it worked, it all worked out. Um, and so we, I think we started the process in July or beginning of August and we were out here by mid October. So it was, yeah, that, that kind of piece, um, these days. So I actually had a little bit of a revelation about a year ago when my husband came into my office and he said, I don't know what's going on with you, but you don't seem happy and it's making all of us unhappy. So please figure that out. And now a lot of people would think that that's really brutal. <laughs> But it's not. Um, for me, it was not because um, we've been we've been married over 20 years. He knows Yay. me super well. Um, so it, it we have really good communication on stuff like that. Uh, so don't feel like, oh, my gosh, that's offensive. I can't believe he said that to you. Why are you still with that guy? Like, no, 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 no. This is him. He was um, he had a big client that he was traveling out of state for and stuff like that. So he was super stressed. So it wasn't sugar coated at all. And there wasn't a lot of discussion about it but it was a good reality check for me. It was a good, Hey, I see you're miserable. I can't pause and fix it right now, but I want to alert you to the fact that you don't seem to be really happy. And normally you are, and it's been this way for a bit. So sort yourself out. I was like, oh, well, and you're okay. not, and you're not hiding it from anybody. Clearly not. I mean, I, I thought I was, but apparently not <laughs> maybe from myself. I don't know if I fully knew, but everybody else knew. So, okay. I'm going to get on this. So I figured out that 
you know, I, I did exactly what you said. Let me figure out what it is I absolutely would love to do and build the business to suit me rather than forcing me to suit the business. That's what I had been doing that was not working. So I flipped it. So what would I like to do? Well, I really like this Zoom thing. I want to do that more. How can I, and I'd already been figuring out, like, how could I do more virtual stuff and not have to spend so much time driving around all the time? Because I'm not a huge fan of driving around. Like, I, I drive just fine, but I don't find it fun or productive. I was doing audiobooks. That was cool, but eh, it wasn't my favorite. So it's like, how could I serve more people without having to go all over the place? And how could I spend more days uh, in pajama pants and not have to, you know, get fully dressed up fancy to go do a thing? So, uh, and how could I be more of a content creator? Because I love creating courses and content and teaching. Like, I love teaching. And uh, how could I do that more and still serve people and get paid for it? And how can I just make something and share it with, with the world and then get paid for that? So I've spent the last year since, and then I want to travel. So my other piece is how can I make it so that once my kids move on, because, you know, we're in high school, we're getting there. They're, they're in a few more years and they're going to bounce. I know, right? <laughs> <It's> like, ah! <laughs> but that's going to happen. And I'm like, when that happens, how can I be free to go other places and not be stuck to a particular market, a particular location, you know, a particular thing? I get a nice laptop. I throw it in my bag. We go hook up to Wi-Fi somewhere and I can do what I do from wherever I'm at. So I said, how do I design this? How do I make this? So I really did do that flip of how do I turn my business into something that works for me instead of how do I just keep grinding away at this business that's telling me how I have to be and then be miserable being that way. So that's what I've that's what I've done. And it's fabulous. I'm so happy. <laughs> so well, and, great. And there's there's too many people that have started a business because they couldn't work for somebody else or they're they're frustrated with the way their boss did it they're frustrated and they 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 know they have better expertise they know they could serve people better but they don't consider the process and they don't consider you know the the delivery and they don't consider they just they just jump into into providing the service and they become a slave to their business and and in fact basically they become a a uh, employee of themselves and right like robert kiyosaki would say they have a terrible boss and so you know um that asking those questions is so powerful yeah right what what would i like to do how would i like to do it and then of course the the next most important question to to designing those things is who do i want to do it for yes. so let's dig into how did you figure that piece out how did I figure that piece out? I never want another entrepreneur to go through what I had to go through to figure it out. I do not ever want another entrepreneur to cry at their desk at 10 o'clock at night or lay awake in bed trying to figure out how am I going to make it through one more miserable day of just struggling and grinding and knowing that they're doing what they want to do, but not understanding why it's not going the way they thought it was going to go. That's my inspiration. I want to teach people using all of my talents, skills, abilities, everything I've got, teach them to build themselves, teach them a better way. Um, so that's, that's it. That's, that's where I get inspired and that's what I, aim to do and those are the people that i serve it's those entrepreneurs who are just like flying by the seat of their pants became their own boss but they're just grinding at a job for a different boss and that boss is almost worse than their other boss because they don't let them have any time off and <laughs> they make them work late they make them take phone calls on weekends and what's up with that <laughs> You know, so yeah, and, and the people who are just kind of doing the fly by the seat of their pants entrepreneur thing, you know, it's working, but they're not planning for anything beyond. They don't know how they can ever step back or step away. They can't even do a two or three day weekend without feeling like the business is going to fall apart before they get back. You know, 
that kind of thing, putting those systems and processes in place, even just the overwhelm of the task list or the calendar, like not scheduling breaks in between meetings. So it's like, where's your lunch happening? <laughs> did we did we eat today or are we hangry on all of our calls this afternoon, right? So yeah, all of that kind of stuff. So let's talk a little bit about, obviously you learned some you know, crazy lessons in the studio in, in allowing another partner to come in and, and change oh, yeah. the, change the vibe. Right. 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 Without, without knowing that it would be a disaster. Right. Yep. And then of course, breaking a lease, getting sued, all of those, all of those lessons. Um, it's, those can be the lessons that, that you, you say, well, I'm just not meant to be an entrepreneur. Or they can be the lessons that say, oh, I've got this and I'm going to do this even better. Right. Yeah. The, you know, the, the concept of failing forward is such a good one because when all that stuff was happening, I felt like it was the worst thing ever. And I was mad about it and sad about it. And every time someone would come up and tell me, oh, I'm so sorry, your studio closed. I really loved it there. I had such a great time. I would get angry. I'd be nice on the surface. I'd be like, oh, thank you. Me too. You know, like that. But I was on the inside so upset because I'm like, then why didn't you shop there more? Why didn't you come there? Like, I was just like, why didn't you support us better? Why'd you leave? You Like, I was so mad, so mad when all that stuff happened. Um, because I felt like all these people after the fact were trying to be supportive. And I'm like, I needed your support back then before the disaster. Now I am in such a different place because, well, for one, I was doing a face-to-face -face switch partners as part of the routine business before COVID hit. You know, if I would have still been in business when COVID hit, all of my income would have been gone for two solid years, maybe even still struggling to build, build back. So grateful that I didn't have to deal with that with that business. Um, grateful that I probably would not have made the income that I wanted to make in that business, particularly splitting with two partners what we were doing. It, it was a trade your time for money business. And you can only have a group class that's as big as your dance space is, you know, as big as your floor is. Uh, and I hadn't figured out the formula. That was, we were getting there. We were getting there and figuring out the formula to make it more profitable. But I hadn't gotten it to the level where I wanted it to be. And chances are it would have taken me quite some time to get it to the level where I wanted it to be. So looking back at it, there were a lot of things that were not ever going to match with my eventual, like actual big goal. The, the freedom of being able to travel and go places and the the opportunity to, you know, have unlimited income and not just trade my time for money. You know, those kinds of things were probably not going to happen for me there. And if they did, it was going to be 20 years down the road type of a thing, uh, which I was not willing to wait that long. So it turns out now that I see that closure as a total gift just like, oh, thank goodness for getting me out of that situation, letting me learn the lessons so I can teach other people so that they don't have to go through quite so much of a struggle and gifting me a way to get out of there and go start the thing I'm supposed to be doing. Because if I hadn't left that, no phone calls, no people telling me, hey, help me with this, help me with that, coach me on this. I need your expertise, be my thinking partner. Wouldn't, wouldn't have gotten that. So, you know, I, I, now I'm just thrilled and people are like, oh, we loved it there. And I'm like, thanks, me too. <laughs> and I genuinely mean it. Like, I genuinely mean it because the time that we had there, I loved it. And now that we're gone, I love that too. So it's all worked out. So I love, I, I love the, the expression of gratitude. And so let's dig into the power of gratitude in, yeah. for your personal growth, but also for that attitude shift from get caught up in the negative and mad and angry versus this, this actual honest appreciation for, for the experience. Right. So I have learned and not on my own. I got some help. I, got, I have a coach. We still, even though we met more frequently before, but we meet once a month, even now. Um, and I tried going without for a while. I was like, no, I'm good. And then I was like, you know what? Things just go better when we talk once a month. So let's just talk once a month. 
but th one of the things I have learned is, you know, wherever there is challenge, there is an equal level of support. And wherever you have this wonderful feeling of support and everything's easy, somewhere else there's an equal level of challenge. So I no longer just focus on the pit of despair, you know, like I'm no longer just thinking about that piece when I'm in something, I actively look for the support and the other side and the learning teaching that comes out of the negative experience. Now, I might not be able to look at it right away. Please don't get the wrong idea that I'm perfect. And I'm like, oh, you know, everything's great. No, 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 no. I still get super mad and angry about stuff. And I still have to work through the heavy emotional part before I can find the learning or the gift. Um, but I am, I now know that it's there and I now know to search for it. So I actively look for it. And when I find it, then I get to be grateful about it. Go, oh, great. That, oh, awesome. This, I've also, because you asked about gratitude, um, express gratitude for all kinds of things. So I posted a reel the other day and it got 73 likes in like the first four hours. And for me, like I don't normally get that. And so I was like, yes, look at all this awesomeness that's happening. Like I was so excited, you know, for the, for the small, tiny gifts that come my way. And I feel like by being in that state of continually appreciating things that come to you, even if you didn't ask for them or whatever, it it allows you to be ready to receive the things you did request. Or maybe it's not going to show up the way you requested it. It's going to show up even better because you had some limited thinking, but hey, let's just give you this gift anyway. So that's kind of, I find being grateful works a whole lot better than not. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, this one this one might be a challenge, but so obviously okay. you've had a partnership go go bad, so I had some relationships get yeah. get broken. I want to dig into forgiveness and the need mm -hmm. for forgiveness, but for me, most importantly, I want to talk about Camille forgiving Camille in the yes. process. Yes, that was hard. That was hard. Um, I think I was mad at me for years because, you know, I caused all this difficulty and frustration, not just, you know, it was our, our clients that we couldn't serve anymore and our instructors that were with us that we couldn't serve anymore. And I brought debt on my family and I didn't spend enough time with my kids. And, you know, now my husband and I had actually had debt when we left California, paid it all down. And here I was putting us right back in that same spot again. Like, oh yeah, I, I messed up lots of stuff. Um, now, on the other side, I can look for all of the great things that came out of that. And we've got those too. You know, I actually came home. I spent more time with the kids. We got out of debt. I was committed to not messing it up again. So I got our retirement in place, college funds in place, like all the stuff got done. You know, so, so many things came out of that. But I definitely was angry with myself for a long, long time and feeling like not enough, not not sufficient, not worthy type of deal. Well, when you feel like that, guess what you get? More of the same. <laughs> so it, it, it was, I realized I had to kind of break that cycle. And when I was able to get the learning from the experience, you know, you're going to feel the pain and the difficulty and the struggle until you learn the lesson. And after you learn the lesson, you can let go of the, the struggle and the pain and just keep the lesson and then replace that with new things that you want. It took me a while to learn the lesson. So guess who had to hold on to the pain for a while and not forgive until I learned. The, and when I learned the lesson, then we were able to forgive myself and move on and forgive the partners too. You know, that was hard as well. Um, both partners did things that made life harder and made the business collapse. And so I held some anger towards them for, for quite some time, you know, sort of blaming them for their piece of the action uh, until I realized, well, let's just turn all this and point the fingers all back at me and ask, what could I have done differently? 
what signals were there that I chose to ignore? When did I not speak up when I should have, you know, what decisions did I make that were not for our betterment, all of that kind of stuff. So really taking responsibility for my piece in what happened and my lack of making changes to make things go better. Uh, and when I, when I was able to own it, then I was able to forgive myself for it because I wasn't blaming somebody else. And I had learned, you know, the pieces of the lesson that, that were there for me to learn. We will be right back after this short break. This episode is sponsored by the newly released book, Dream Life Planner, Move from Tired and Overwhelmed to Free and Empowered by Noelle L. Peterson, available on Amazon. Or you can order a personalized signed copy at empower, E-M-P-O-W-E-R, to dream.com. That's empower, number two, dream.com. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe, leave a review, tell your friends. Welcome back. Let's get back to more greatness. And what changed? What changed? Do that. Oh, goodness. Talk about a weight being lifted. I mean, that part was great. <laughs> <laughs> no more sulking around and, you know, kind of thing. Um, it also changed who I was attracting. So if you're living in this misery, grumpy, whatever space, guess what kind of people are going to want to hang out with you? It's all the misery, grumpy, whatever kind of people. <laughs> if those aren't the, the perfect people perfect kind of coaching clients. <laughs> Yeah, people I really want to work with all the time, and they're going to be super receptive to things that I ask them to try, and it's going to be amazing, right? So yeah, the, the people that are so easy to coach, and they just want to they just want to put some effort in and <laughs> really listen well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, those people. Uh, so yeah, so when you when you're in that state, you attract those people, and when you are in a state of gratitude and learning. Uh, under taking responsibility for things, then you attract those people. So I was able to level up my people. And that's been fantastic because now I meet so many more great people. I get to be on podcasts like this and talk about awesome stuff. And so, you know, it's it's so such a change, such a change. And of course, you know, personal life as well. Like I just walk around kind of bouncy most of the time. <laughs> pretty, pretty happy person again. So it's great. Which is good when you have teenagers. Oh, dude. <laughs> Talk about that support and challenge. <laughs> In some ways, things are amazing. In other ways, I got a lot of challenge going on. Because, <laughs> yeah, teenagers. <laughs> but you face that challenge differently. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So rather than, you know, being frustrated or angry with them or that kind of thing. I mean, there's some days that I have to go, I am the adult. I am the adult. Like, I'm just like. <laughs> talking myself down off the ledge type of a deal. Um, but other times I try to try to understand it from their point of view, like try to see it from where they are, try to try to remember what it was like to be stuck in my parents' house, but really want to be on my own, to be trying to figure out how to navigate you know, the social grown up world, I'm not really a grown up, but I sort of feel like I want to be, but also I don't quite know how to do it. And like, it's so weird and difficult and all that kind of stuff. It's like, let me try to remember where they are right now and understand where they're coming from so that when I communicate back, I can attempt, doesn't always work, but attempt to put things into their language and explain it in a way that I'm like, reminding them of the result they want so that we can have a productive conversation instead of a, a, an argumentative conversation or a, or a, a clashing type of conversation. Try to walk them down a path. They're smart kids. So try to walk them down a path that involves some logic and some, well, does this make sense? And, you know, stuff like that, rather than just telling them, no, you can't do that. Because that, of course, then that's the first thing they have to do. So good. So obviously, you've recognized the power of questions, and you've asked yourself some really powerful questions, at least in reflection of the story you tell yourself now of right, your past, right. and designing your business. So so when did you learn the power of questions? 
I will probably, I started on this power of question. It's been, it's been several years. So I'm going to say maybe four or five years ago when I first started getting into the power of questions. And I actually took a sales training, which was kind of like a, you know, non creepy, non old school sort of a training, which really teaches you to get to know your prospect, to understand, ask lots of questions so that you can provide value and figure out if the thing you have is even a viable solution for them or not. You know, you, you, you can't just run in and tell them it's got all these bells and whistles and you got to do it and then try hope that they just throw money at you because that's ridiculous. Uh, so that's probably my first introduction to asking questions. And since then, you know, my experience as a coach, it's been great because I've learned that you you get so much more when you ask a good question. Um, and then, of course, uh, working in financial services, I have to ask a lot of questions over there to, to tailor something for somebody. Uh, and people are super awkward about talking about money sometimes. So knowing how to ask delicate questions and get them to the right place <laughs> has been it. And then a couple years ago, I started up a podcast and uh, have just been honing my question asking ever since. So all of the one-to-ones that you do in networking plus having the podcast and asking questions of guests. Now I, I might as well be asking myself some too. I'm asking everybody else. That's so good. All right. We mentioned, you mentioned one of my triggers, trigger words, talking about money and people don't Ooh. want to talk about money. Yeah, Yeah. So how do we help people talk about money? We talk about money. Mm. <laughs> Easy, right? <laughs> Help people talk about money by talking about money so it becomes not weird. Um, it's it's just kind of the only way. Making it a comfortable topic involves addressing all of the stuff that is usually uncomfortable about it. We We put all these attachments to like, how much money is in my bank account determines my worth. And it's like, oh, no, the money in your bank account is a number. And that's a tool for you to use to do things. But it is not your innate value. You know, and it's not a way to compare your value to someone else's value, because it's not really something you can compare. Everybody has value. It's just all in different forms. So detaching a little bit from the money is the only way I can prove that I matter. Um, And then we can start to have more conversations about it because now you don't have to be caught up on, I don't know if I have enough to match up with them and if I'm going to be okay, you know, like, and we, this is just old story stuff that gets programmed in somewhere when we're little from some random event and, you know, you lose five bucks that you got for your allowance that week. And then you get lectured because you lost the five bucks. And now forever you think that you're irresponsible with money and you can't be trusted with money, you know, cause you just put this little story in there, stuff like that. So figuring those out, unwinding them, um, and just continuing to have the conversation makes it more comfortable. Just like anything else that's awkward. Let's just bring up the awkward and get it over with. <laughs> so. Well, and and let's make it not awkward, right? Let's right. let's recognize that, you know, the one thing the wealthy do when they get into rooms together is they talk about money. They talk about their deals. They talk about the interest rates that they're getting, not giving. They talk about, you know, how they're how they're using money. And for them, money is simply a tool for the majority of people, like you mentioned, money is the measure of their value, right? How many dollars per hour am I, is my labor worth? How much? And there's there's no discussion of money being this tool and separating your value from your money's value, right? And and I, each of us has an innate value, and I love that the way you put it. That it, it's in different forms, right? So 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 some people have this ability or that gift or, or this knowledge right now that we're in this information age and, and, and we pay, we compensate people for the value they bring. Right. So as a coach originally, right. You're, you start out in the same space, you know, well, as, as a pastor, I was making, you know, this amount a year. And so coaching, I should be worth this much. And if I break that down into these coaching sessions, each one's going to be a hundred dollars an hour. And, but if I can work with a client and I can help a client increase their revenue, 10,000, 20,000, you know, 
what's the value of that? Right. And, and, and value changes, changes the conversation. And so uh, I love the word value. Of course, I love the idea of human value and adding value to, to people from the level of encouragement and love all the way to the level of financial freedom and, and liberty. And so, so value to me covers that, covers that spectrum. Right. And, and I want to, I want to encourage people to talk about money. There was this corporate idea, right? Which of course, you know, you sign a contract and you're employed and blah, blah, blah. Not allowed to talk about your salary. That's a right. Isn't it weird? Well, and, and you know what it sets up? It sets yeah, up these disparities. Yes. These are all disparities. So disparities, two people yeah. in the same job with different compensation. Because no. one negotiated a little bit differently and, you know, because somebody was having a good day or a bad day or whatever. And that's what you get stuck with. Yeah. And, and because, and because we've allowed, we've allowed this deception to occur. Now we have, you know, women who get 10 to 15% lower salaries than, than their equivalent male counterparts. We mm -hmm. have biases to gender and to race and to, you know, all these ideas that somebody's value is different based on the category that, that they're put in rather right. than based on simply their ability to perform the, the job. Yeah. And, and the companies have gotten away with this idea of not publishing salaries and not saying, you know, well, I get this much and I get this much. And we stop the people from talking about their money. And, and then of course they go home and they say, well, I can't talk about my money. And so I don't talk about my money with my partner and my spouse. And we dig this, this downward spiral of a hole because we're both spenders instead of one being a spender and one being a saver, which can yeah. save many relationships from that spiral. Right. Yeah. I, we need to talk about money. We solve so many problems when we talk about so money. Many. So many Ooh. problems. So many problems. I would love for companies to just have a salary for a job. And a little like when, you know, when you're a teacher or in the military or something, it's this education, this many years, this job makes this. And here's the promotions that you get for more time kind of thing. And it's on a scale and it's laid out and everybody knows what the deal is and you don't have to negotiate anything. I think that would be wonderful in the corporate world of just here's what you get for this job and here's what you get for this promotion or this many years and here's what you get for this and that's what we offer and take it or leave it right. so much so much stress would go away well and, and it would solve the company's issues too because now we don't negotiate this this is the value of this position and you either agree yep. to to receive that value or you don't and it's based right. on like like the military they have a chart yep. They have a chart. Chart, they have a chart. Charts, charts based on rank or position and yep. years in service. Right. And, and you, as you get further and further along, your salary yeah. moves hopefully in an upward direction. I right. know a few that moved in roller coaster yeah, directions, <laughs> which is part of why I'm no longer, you know, in the military. Because the idea of that going down at any point, just because I made the wrong person mad, was like I'm yeah. not going to, you know, because. Yep. Because not only did they fine you, they took away your rank, which lowers you down the chart. And wait, wait a minute, I got to pay a fine and lower chart? No, I'm not. I'm not going to participate yeah. in this. No, thank you. <laughs> in this, uh -huh. in this system, and yeah. that was that really was part of one of the reasons that that I chose to no longer stay. In, I mean, I, I had a great service, but I had so much more opportunity outside of that, right. and so recognized. You know that possible. But I bet the pay part was easy. I bet you didn't all get together and like whisper about what your paycheck was going to be or anything, because everybody knew. Everybody exactly. Knew. Yep. Everybody and knew. and it, they literally printed on a card. Everybody can get a copy of the card, and and you know based on years of service, what rank, right where your your salary was going to be for that year. You know, and each year they publish a new chart because the Congress or whoever gets the permission to make those changes to fit the national. I don't know budget. how that works. But it, yeah, there's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> there is a thing. Yeah. So powerful. So how do you help people, uh, mom and pop, husband and wife, um, you know, a couple kids at home trying to figure out all these things? How do you help them talk about money and feel better mm -hmm. talking about money? Yeah. So we talk about money. You know, we, we get on together, have the meetings together, whether that's over Zoom or in person or whatever it is we're doing. 
Um, and we just sort of go through everything. I usually have them watch my free class and I say, okay, watch the class and see, you know, see what questions you have from there, what that brings up for you. If they have, if there's anything new, because then at least they have a starting place of something they've both seen and they both know about. And now we can start asking questions there. And that's really helpful to have something to start with. Because uh, if we just sit down and say, what's going on, you typically have one person that does all the talking and the one person that sits there with their arms folded and kind of in the corner like, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> that's about all they want to do. One will participate and the other one doesn't want to. So I am really conscientious about trying to bring everyone into the conversation who is a decision maker and make sure that if we're making a decision on what we're going to do with our money, everyone's really okay with it. Uh, and I tend to watch their face a lot and ask a lot of questions because I want to see if one person's like, yeah, that sounds good. And the other person's, you know, internally going, there is no way I'm doing that, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and if it's figure out a budget, we do that. If it's, um, you know, figure out how to put some life insurance in place or, you know, we've got old 401ks hanging out that we're not managing. We do that kind of thing. Uh, it's It's really just meeting them wherever they are. There's been lots of people who have come to me and they desperately want to save, but they're thousands of dollars in debt and they haven't even gotten that piece out of it. So it's like, okay, let's get a plan together to get you out of debt or at least get you on the path to being out of debt and then start practicing saving. And next year when you've got a pile saved up, we'll meet again and we'll decide if it was time to do anything with that pile or not. So I've, I've put lots of people on practice runs, like pra you're going to practice for a year and see what you can do and then come back. I actually had a family who I think I talked to them like four years ago was the first time one of them um, came to an event that I was hosting and uh, it was the wife. And so she came, we had a great time. She loved it. She said, we're just, we've got this, 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 it's such a mess, but we'd really love to buy a house. And Okay. So I did, you know, the best coaching that I could for them at that time. And we kind of talked about everything and they went, paid off their debt three or four months ago, they moved into their house. Nice. So well, Yeah. The biggest challenge is this is one of those areas. And, and I think entrepreneurs are guilty as well is we have two big areas that we need to be very intentional in our lives time and money and the truth about americans the truth about the majority of people is they are not intentional about their time or their money or their money and they're You're and right. they're living and they're living by default yeah. and the challenge with living by default is that you've developed a lifetime of habits a spending habit of how you eat lunch a spending habit of buying coffee on your way to work and i'm not right. saying that these things can't be part of your plan but you, you can be spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars in some of these frivolous things. And if you're not tracking it and you're not aware of it and you're not intentional about what you want to accomplish, you're right. throwing a lot of money down some holes that, that these habits are, are you know, supporting. And yeah. so I think helping people recognize that you want to do this intentionally you want to be intentional and find the ways and places where, yes, we can save money in this space. And what we can do with this saved money, right? The motivation, the driver, um, right. you know, because because a college fund is not exciting. Retirement for most people is so far away. They feel like, oh, whatever. I can just kick that. I can keep kicking that can down the road. Yep. Yep. But of course, you know, we teach the power of compounding and we start to show them look, if you do this early and you do it fat, you know, you do it quick and you so do it, easy. it's, it's so much easier. Right. Yeah. And the further you kick the can down the road, the bigger the can gets right. The emptier the can is. And, and then the it's like a giant boulder. You can't kick it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, so I, I, I love that intentionality. I want to help people be responsible for your life. Know that you have options right. and know that even if you feel broke month to month to month, I just can't save yet. I just can't save yet. I just can't have a retirement yet. Stop telling yourself that and find out the truth. 
by being intentional with how you spend your money and how you program your plan, make a plan and then figure out, all right, how do I change my habits to stick to the plan? What's the motivation? What's the driver so that I can stick to these new habits? Exactly. So I think the problem for people wanting to save money or work towards a financial goal and the problem for entrepreneurs is kind of the same problem. And this is probably why it's so easy for me to do, to do both because we're solving the same problem in both, both situations, which is they haven't sorted out the priorities. They haven't sat down, figured out what the goal is, figured out what the result is that they want, and then put a plan in place to actually hit that result. They're like, yeah, I kind of want this or I sort of want that, but they haven't put the plan in place to do it. And they haven't really internalized that priority to say, this is what I'm doing. Other things are not getting in my way. This is my number one priority, whether it's save for the house, pay off the debt, send the kids to college, you know, grow the business, get 10 clients, whatever the things are, they haven't made that their mission. They're not like, this is what I'm doing. Everybody else better move because this is what I'm doing. Once you get that priority set, you're good. You can't be stopped. And when you were just talking about it, and I, I, I was thinking, you know, if you are always saying I can't do this or I, there's no way, I don't know how, if you can flip that to a question, because we talked about questions, if you can flip that to a question, how am I saving so much? Why do I have so much money in my bank account? Your brain will work on a question. So just choose which question you want to ask. Don't pick the wrong question. Pick a good question. <laughs> pick a question that leads to the result you would like to have. So pick a question that says, why do I have so much money in my bank account? Why do I have so many customers? Why is it so easy for me to get business? Why is my business growing so quickly? Pick that kind of a question and let your brain go to work on that. Don't pick a question that says, well, I don't know why I can say, why can't I save any money? Why don't I have any customers? Well, because you keep asking why you don't have any. So you don't have any. <laughs> well, and, and it's, it, this is super powerful. What you're talking right here is so, so powerful because when, when you say I can't, or, or you say, I'll never save for, you know, never save for college. Right. Yeah. And, and when you if you if you say it in a way that that challenges the brain, how can I ever save for college? And your brain goes, you can't, right? Your brain, that little voice in your head says, yeah, you can't do it. No, it'll never yeah, happen. You're right. No, not when you that. ask when you ask the question though, when you ask the question is how do I have so much saved for college? The brain doesn't reject it. The brain doesn't argue with it. The brain goes to work and says, well, how can we do that? It's a very yeah. interesting transition that your brain rejects these statements of, oh, I can make $10,000 a month. Oh, I can make $10,000 a week. The brain goes, what? You? How would you do that? Right? Nonsense. But I've if you ask the question, yeah, well, I've seen your work ethic, right? Like the brain knows it's saying, no way. But if you say, even the statement I am making 10,000, the brain can fight a little bit against, but when yep, you ask the question fighting. in a way, you know, man, how's that $10,000 coming to my, you know, coming in the bank account every week, the brain's going, wait, how are we doing that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to figure yeah. it out. I'm so I love, I love that there's, that's a super powerful transition in, in, in how the subconscious works and in, you know, that programming your subconscious because typically even even these affirmation statements that a lot of us use a lot of coaches have put out there the brain still rejects a bunch of them the brain still says you know oh i am wealthy oh i am rich and, and the brain's going yeah whatever yeah right and the brain's rejecting those but the minute you say why am i so wealthy the brain's going why are we so wealthy Right. Yeah. And the brain starts yeah. working on it instead of instead of that flat out rejection. And that first 10 seconds is so important because the majority of affirmation statements and a lot of those statements get rejected right away. But now we've turned it around and the brain starts working on it going, hmm, wait, what? <laughs> and so yeah. it's actually using the brain against itself. 
And, That's and right. that voice and doesn't just... even that voice doesn't even pay attention to it because it's like the voice says, "Oh, that's not something I need to reject. This is okay." Yeah, we're solving the problem. We're good. We're super, good. super powerful. Super, super powerful. powerful. So I learned this from uh, the little book of affirmations, spelled with an O, by Noah Saint John. So I don't know if that's somebody you want to put on your target list for your show, but uh, he's actually was... he's actually on there. Yeah, he's... great. Yeah, great book. Great book. Yeah, and he does. And I've have... been using it. It works. Affirmations fabulous. for a millionaire and affirmations like he's the Hollywood coach and 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 he has some good free free stuff out there. So you can look for affirmations and, yep. and Noah St. John. Um, absolutely good stuff. All right. So with all this, all the business successes and failures you've had, um, what is what is your biggest challenge? My oh my gosh. Okay. So my biggest challenge today, so I've got my online courses going and I've got my group coaching program going. And my biggest challenge is that I want to put everything from my brain out for my people right this moment. And I cannot go quite that fast. <laughs> so so I, I struggle with finding that um, kind of regulating myself, I guess. I love the teaching part. I love diving into writing a new course and recording more content and working on my book and all of this kind of thing. So I would just kind of be buried in here and working on that. And I forget to eat. I'd forget to, you know, I, I'd forget to shower. Like that's my biggest challenge is that I just want to be in here creating and teaching nonstop. And I still have a life out there that I do love and wish to participate in. It's just once I get in the little zone of doing my thing, I'm doing my thing. Um, so, yeah, my challenge is that I just can't quite provide everything that's up in my brain for the people quite as fast as I would love to provide it for them. But it's going at a reasonable pace that I can sustain and still live life to. So we're good. Nice. <laughs> but that is a challenge. It's a constant challenge. I want it all yesterday. That's beautiful. So, so what has been the impact of, of hosting your podcast? Oh my gosh, it's been such an amazing journey for me. Um, I hope that my audience has gotten as much value out of it as I have, but I get to meet these people. I talk to them during the podcast, but I also talk to them off camera too. And the lessons and growth that have come out of everything in the podcast has just been amazing. Like I did not expect that. I expected to provide a service for other people. I did not expect that I would learn just as much or more because I'm talking to those people. I'm getting to know them. I'm doing the podcast with them. Then I'm doing all the show notes or editing or anything else. So I'm watching it again, looking for quotes. Like I'm really getting the lessons from all of these people that are on the podcast. And I had no idea that was going to happen. Did not expect it at all. And it's been amazing. Have you had the same, same experience? Did you get more out of your podcast than you thought? Oh, well, I kind of started mine to, to get more. And so I really started mine to make some of those connections with, with people that wouldn't, wouldn't take a phone call from me or wouldn't certainly attend a group coaching session of mine to, to give information. And so I really started it for those connections and because I wanted to ask these people those questions. And so I knew I would learn. I would learn a ton. You were ready. Yeah. 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 So my challenge has been, you know, now that I've I've done it, I built it with that intention. It's like, wait a minute. Now I should have monetized that monetization should have been a part of my intention as well. And so part of the strategy. Yeah. Yeah. And so adding that strategy after the fact is, is a little more challenging, although we have wonderful sponsors with perfect publishing and, and, and their dose of hope book, which you can, you know, get a dose of hope.com. So um, lots of great stories of hope. And, and so, yeah, there's just, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful world though of these wonderful connections and it's how you and I met and been yeah. on each other's shows now. And so, right. so, so powerful and the network that's creating has, has just been um, inspiring, like really like hearing, sharing people's journeys and inspiration of, you know, the ups and downs of this entrepreneurial journey. So in order to continue inspiring, I always want to ask, what's your most memorable date with your husband? Most memorable date with my husband. 
Well, I don't know if it's, I mean, it's not really one date. Uh, All right. But he, he planned a trip for us to go to France a few years ago. And I, he, I wasn't really in on the plan, but, you know, at first I was, I, I'm like a slow decider, not love surprises kind of person. So I was a little like, we're going to what and when, but I thought I, I had a different concept for what we were doing at that time. And it was hard getting out there. Once I got on board, it was hard getting out there because our flight got changed and delays and like getting. So after the first 24 hours, when we were finally there, it turned out to be one of the most amazing trips we've ever taken. The kids stayed home, grandparents and family helped, and we, right? <laughs> this is great. We just got to hang out and go explore and do all the things and talk to each other. And, and it was a really good trip. And I feel like the first couple of days, like I didn't even have anything to talk about because I was so like trying to relax and just oh my gosh, I hadn't realized, you know, like how tired and how worn down I was until we got there and I didn't have anything that I had to be responsible for, um, except for maybe picking where we were going to go to dinner. <laughs> so, so a couple of days of just kind of quiet. And then after that, we just had a blast. We went and climbed, walked everywhere and saw stuff and, you know, did things and ate all the food that was on the, you know, the, oh, let's try this bread and let's try this vendor and oh, more crepes. Yes. You know, like just so many things. Um, so it's not really one date, but it was one trip. And I would say that was probably the most memorable one. And then we did it in the fall of 2019. So, you know, travel was still easy and free and wonderful and joyous and stuff. And we didn't have to do all the restrictions. Beautiful timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, so we hit, we hit that trip right before everything kind of went topsy-turvy and it turned out to be a, a really wonderful thing that we did together. So I love that. And it's all, it's all him that planned it and figured it out. So that's, that's nice. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Real quick. How important is, is play and fun as a mother of teenagers and entrepreneurs? <laughs> yes. Uh, just as important as everything else. You know, it's, if you just work all the time or just focus on hard parenting, follow the rules all the time or any of that kind of stuff, you're going to get burned out. You know, we all are going to be a little off balance in some direction, no matter what, you know, you're, a little too much work over here, a little too much play over there, that kind of thing. It's just trying not to be out of balance in any one area for too long. So you got to have play just like you have everything else. And if you can really set it up well, you're going to be playing at work too. Mm -hmm. So that, and I kind of feel like that's what I do some days. Like some days are rough. You know, I got to make hard phone calls or I got to make tough decisions kind of thing. But there are most days when I'm helping somebody and we're fixing their business and I'm doing the thing I'm best at and I'm just playing at work. And that makes me even better when I go to hang out with my family. Cause then we just play again. <laughs> we just play more. Yeah, so absolutely. Great. All right. You spend an hour networking, having coffee with a young entrepreneur and you're going to leave them with Camille's words of wisdom. What would you share? Oh my gosh. Um, I kind of have a phrase. This is the one that I put in when I sign a book for somebody. I've got one book that I've written, another one that I'm editing right now. And uh, this is the piece that I sign when I sign my name. Enjoy the journey. If you enjoyed the show, please like, subscribe, or leave a review. We have a free gift for you at addvaluemindset.com. That's addvaluemindset.com. We've collected some of the best mindset secrets shared by successful entrepreneurs on our podcast, and we want to give them to you for free. ADDValueMindset.com. In our next episode, Bob Berg and I have a great conversation about his book, Endless Referrals, which led to the creation of the Go-Giver series written with John David Mann. We talk about the background of the mentor relationship and share some ideas for finding your own mentor to create the life that you want.